set three or four habits that you want to create for yourself. So find six habits and decide every day you're going to do four, but never compensate day to day. There's reasons for doing this. Let's say one day a train, if you're not already, you know, run, if you're not already doing that, write, if you're not already doing that gratitude practice, NSDR, and I don't know, eat a vegetable. So you're going to list those out on your calendar. And then every day you're going to do at least four, but as many as five. But if one day you only get one, you don't carry over and do 10 the next day. If you understand the dopamine system, you'll understand why, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to train up a circuitry for giving yourself random intermittent reward for performing these habits on a regular basis. So people will go do these heroic workouts or they'll do a ton of stuff and then they'll reward themselves and they've just undermined the whole process of being able to do that consistently. I, it's a little complicated, but the way that reward schedules work is you're trying to teach the circuitry to work regularly, be rewarded only every once in a while and at random. Look to the neuroscience of habit building. You would be wise to put certain habits at the early part of the day and certain habits at the later part of the day. I call phase one of the day from zero to nine hours after waking. That period of the day, assuming that you're getting that sunlight exposure and a little bit of movement, but even if you're just getting some sunlight exposure, is going to be associated with high epinephrine, high dopamine, slightly higher cortisol. Certain habits we could call linear habits. It's in, it, these are things that you know how to do and you just need to do them. And so those sorts of habits would go well in that zero to nine hours. Then phase two, go from about 10 hours till about 16 or 17 hours after waking. We tend to be a little bit sleepier. We tend to be a little bit calmer, at least not necessarily sleepy. It's clear that other habits that have to do with what we call nonlinear brain operations, things like creative writing, brainstorming with a group, brainstorming with yourself, analytic work that is where there is no clear right answer. It's not plug and chug. It's more exploratory. Go best in the second phase, phase two. I was thinking about, you know, rolling jujitsu earlier. I have a I can't even call it rolling jujitsu. I've only done it once, but clearly there's a lot of moment to moment creativity and kind of sorting things out. Whereas weightlifting, it's sets and reps. You're trying to complete a certain amount of sets and reps. You're trying to cover a certain amount of distance running linear versus nonlinear. And then of course, there's the 17 to 24 hours, which is phase three. And during that time, you want to be engaging one set of habits, which is sleep. Okay. <laughs> Roughly, it could be 16 to 24 hours, et cetera. So try and put the habits you're trying to form into the times of day in which those will actually be easiest. This sort of violates the earlier rule of try and access limbic friction. If there's something that you're really trying to adopt more exercise and that exercise is running a certain distance in a certain amount of time, put that in the early part of the day. If you're trying to do creative work, do in the second part of the day. If you are trying to develop a new skill that's exploratory, second part of the day. If you're trying to learn a skill that has defined steps already, it's linear, early part of the day. It, people will just find that it's simpler to do it in some in that fashion. The other thing is that if you look at the science of goal setting, there are clear data. There's a woman um, at New York University, Emily Balketis, and she's described that while we like to think about envisioning success as the best way to set goals and develop new habits. It turns out the at least the research shows it's far more effective to imagine the catastrophic effects of failure. It's the darkness none of us want to embrace, but fear is the more powerful motivator. But provided you can still think clearly, you don't want to put yourself into a state of panic. So goal setting of if I don't do this every day, I'm looking at diabetes and early death is going to be a much more powerful motivator than imagining you're going, oh, I'm going to be, you know, 10 pounds lighter and, you know, I can you know, bench press 15% more by Christmas this time of year. It's great to have goals. It's also great to have motivators that are based on real world fear. The best way to reward yourself for a job well done is random intermittent reward. We've been talking up until now that, you know, effort reward is the cycle, but if you want to keep, remember dopamine, non-infinite, but replenishable, how about not spend it at all? How about use what the casinos use in order to keep yourself into a state of motivation? So if you are checking off the boxes, I did this behavior, this new habit, that new habit, that new habit, great, do that. But don't celebrate every win. Celebrate random intermittent wins.
think about this. You're, uh, what do you guys call it? Behind glass, you're shooting, uh-huh. right? And you're like, oh, God, you're missing. Every time you miss, the next trial is the one you're paying the most attention to. When you hit, you'd think, oh, the next one, I'm good. No, the next one, why would you be good? You just succeeded. Why would your nervous system pay attention to what happens next? When you succeed, your nervous system goes, oh, that happened that way. And it's a little relaxation. It's a little relaxation. So errors, we know, cue up the forebrain. It increases activity in the prefrontal cortex. You're, I don't get behind glass, but I've thrown darts in a bar. Uh-huh. And you're up there, there are people watching, and you're, we used to do this in graduate school. This is a little bar in Davis, and we'd throw darts, and you know, and you miss, and you're like, mm. you know, you're really, it's almost that little anger, and the next one, you're completely dialed in. But then you're like, bullseye, bullseye, and when you make it, the next one, you're not paying as careful attention to your motor patterns. So you might get lucky, but you're not learning. So errors are key to learning, and the proper ratio of errors to successful trials for optimal learning is very clear from machine learning and from human learning. It's the 85-15 rule. The, how difficult to make a task should be 85% of the time you're performing it correctly, 15% of the time you're performing it incorrectly, more or less, plus or minus 2% if you want to optimize learning. 85% you get it, 15% percent you miss. Yeah, that's about the right level of difficulty for motor skill learning, cognitive learning, et cetera. Any more than that, it's putting too much of a demand on the attentional systems. Any less, you're putting too little demand on the attentional systems. That's what the machine learning shows in humans. That's what the machine learning algorithm is based on human learning. That's what the animal data show. And of course, there'll be some variation on this. But if people are saying, oh, I want to teach these kids Spanish, or I want to teach people how to shoot, well, Make it difficult enough so that they're about 15% error rate. Don't reward yourself with external rewards very often. So make the training its own reward. So if it's I'm going to train and then I'm going to have the pancake breakfast, Uh great. Do it every once in a while. But don't do it every Sunday. Don't do it every workout. So it's not so much about the frequency as much as it is how re- the we, what we call the schedule of reward. So, you know, and you can see this in sports teams and some of the challenges over the years of, you know, everyone gets a trophy. I mean, nothing is more undermining to the dopamine system than that idea. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what happened with that, but I and I don't want to punish anybody because I also don't know who it was. But that group or person who made that decision that everyone gets a trophy clearly did not read the literature about how the neuroscience of reward and the psychology of reward works. You actually diminish the role of rewards in every way, and you take away the ability to access the reward system in the future. You've, you're creating not just, you're not creating soft versions of people. You're actually creating people. They're just like the rat with no dopamine. It's a really sad state. We have a name for that in humans. It's called Parkinson's. You deplete the dopamine system. People get shaky. They can't move. That's in the motor system. But people with Parkinson's also ex- experience extreme lack of motivation and depression because of lack of dopamine. That's the characteristic feature of Parkinson's is lack of dopamine neurons. 